Hello, everybody, and welcome to History Room Live, presented by the Sagadahawk History and Genealogy Room at Patent Free Library. Today, we're going to hear from Karen Richard, who is our resident genealogist, about a little thing called the Main Register. Karen, why don't you tell us about the Main Register? Alrighty, I am going to stop my video sharing, and let me start, hope this, uh, oh, I need the screen sharing option. And okay, let me select the correct one. All right, so let's see if I can make this work properly. Let's get this up there. All right, hopefully, um, Joe, give me a thumbs up if you see it. Okay, cool. Okay. Now, if you're not using the main register or haven't even heard of it, you're missing out on some really fabulous historical information. These annual publications are rich with social history. And although they aren't focused on uh, family history, oops, hold on, I'm a little distracted. These little images here, <laughs> trying to figure out how to get rid of them. Um, sorry. Um, these annual publications uh, aren't necessarily focused on individual people, but you may find your ancestor within them. But even if you don't, you'll still discover numerous fascinating, fascinating details about almost every aspect of life, which can provide insight into the world and daily life at that time. Our topics for today, I'll provide um, brief definitions of the terms register and social history, some description of the main register, from there, we'll go exploring. Then I'll tell you where to find them and how to download the digital versions. Before exploring a resource, it's helpful to know something about it. In this case, I first want to go over a couple general definitions. Here's a brief description of social history. Merriam-Webster describes it as history that concentrates upon the social, economic, and cultural institutions of a people. And below that, I have a couple quotes from Gina Philibert Ortega, who is known in the genealogy world for her extensive knowledge of social history. Social history looks at the everyday lives of people, and she says that it's history on a micro level. And she made these comments during um, a webinar that uh, I listed the title there, and I always enjoy listening to her talks. Now let's look at the word register. According to merriamwebster.com, a register is a written record containing regular entries of items or details, a book or system of public records, and so on. Okay, now we've got the general definitions. Let's get more specific. The main register is an annual publication on main government and commerce that has been published most years since 1820, the year Maine became a state. According to a source I found at the American Antiquarian Society, there were some years in which the register was not published and those are listed on the slide. And uh, that publication is included in the references at the end here. That source only covered up to the mid 1850s. However, the register appears to have been published every year since then. Another important aspect to consider is that the registers aren't necessarily for a calendar year as many specifically indicate that they're from April, May, June, or July of one year to the same month of the following year. Even where the title page only indicates a particular year, such as 1929, the spine of the book will often be printed as 1929-30. Just a few more things to note. As of June 1900, the registers were numbered. 
not every year contains exactly the same information. Not surprisingly, more and more kept being added over the years. Though there were also some topics or lists that stopped being included. There were changes in organizational format. Initially, the books were organized by topic. Eventually, they became organized more by county and by town within the counties. I'm not sure when ads became part of the register. There weren't any in 1820 or 1822, but at some point they became a big part of some of these books. I think especially later, like the 1900s, early 1900s including. In 1843, they're all in the back, but often you'll find some of them in the front. In some cases, you may have a couple dozen pages of ads to get through before you even get to the title page. In one case, I think there were 114 pages of ads just to get to the title page. And I think there were more ads in the back too. Thankfully, you'll also find indexes. At first, these are mainly for topics and for the towns, though eventually an index to advertisers is also included. To further explain the types of information that can be found in the register, I started by making a list of what, was, what I was finding in these books but there was so much that it was overwhelming. Then I realized some of the titles were so long and detailed, I could just use a few of those to give you the gist of what these books contain. This is the title from the main register in 1820, the very first one. Are you ready? The main register in the United States calendar for the year of our Lord 1820 and 44th of American independence, containing civil, judicial, ecclesiastical, and military lists in Maine, associations and corporate institutions for literary, agricultural, and charitable purposes, names of the post towns and postmasters in Maine, also the constitution as reported by the convention, catalogs of the officers of the general government in its several departments and establishments, times of the sittings of the several courts, and a variety of other interesting articles. Now, how about this one from 1856. The main register and business directory for the year 1856, embracing state and county officers and the titles of the laws and resolves of 1855, together with the mercantile, professional, manufacturing, mechanical departments, accurately compiled and alphabetically arranged under their respective headings with a variety of useful information. Last Here's a really good one. The very wordy title from 1873-74. Take a big deep breath. Main State Yearbook and Legislative Manual for the year 1873-4 from May 1, 1873 to May 1 of 1874. Contains the usual calendar matter, diary pages, historical summary of the state, vote for President 1868, for governor for 1870 and 71, and also since the formation of the state, senators for 1871, list of past officers of the state, rights and qualifications of voters, conditions of eligibility to office, I just totally bumbled that word, rateable polls, population and valuation of towns, list of courts, banks, newspapers, postmasters, selectmen, town clerks, clergymen, physicians, Dentists, lawyers, notaries, sheriffs, justices, merchants, manufacturers, etc. Stamp duties, postage rates, revenue officers, U.S. statistics, schools, colleges, orders of Templars, sorry, good Templars, odd fellows, and Masons, etc. Oh, did you get all that? <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty descriptive title right there. Okay, so now let's go exploring. With several decades worth of material, it was really difficult to figure out how to go about this and really show you the wealth of treasures in these books. I finally decided to just use three of them that are several decades apart. I'm going to use Woolwich as a point of focus for some screenshots throughout each of these years, but I've also included several other items in an attempt to convey the wide range of information that can be found in the main register. I should also mention that most of the time you can use the control F feature to search for specific words, phrases, or names. It doesn't always work, but it's worth trying. And I ended up doing that quite a lot to, to find what I was looking for. As Julie Andrews Maria saying, let's start at the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. 
Among other things, the register reflects the political and legal landscape of the state. So the 1820 register contains the Separation Act, along with the Maine Constitution and a list of the members of the convention who created the Maine Constitution. The towns and convention members are arranged by county, Woolwich was part of Lincoln County at the time. The image on the left indicates the town was incorporated in 1859, had 1,050 people enumerated in 1810, and Ebenezer Delano was the member from that town who took part in the convention. Next, we have the official list of votes on separation. On the left are the results from the counties. On the right is the results from Woolwich with 38 for separation and 41 against. It appears the town was pretty evenly split on this issue. Here we have a couple legislative acts, an act concerning navigation and the Revolutionary Pension Act. Each has several pages and you can read them in their entirety online. But here's a sampling of what the Navigation Act is about. Be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, that from and after the 30th of September next, the ports of the United States shall be and remain closed against every vessel owned wholly or in part by a subject or subject of His Britannic Majesty coming or arriving from any port or place in a colony or territory of His Britannic Majesty that is or shall be by the ordinary laws of navigation and trade closed against vessels owned by citizens of the United States. Uh, I think if I'm understanding properly, basically what they're saying is if the bloody Brits are gonna close their ports to us, we shall do the same to them. <laughs> and there is far more to that, of course. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier that at this point, the register is organized by topic, not town. Some of the topics you'll find are justices, banks, post offices and postmasters, churches and ministers, and even coroners. Woolwich had three coroners at this time, Stephen Stinson, Ebenezer Delano, a familiar name there, and Chris P. Ryan. The banks aren't listed by county because there aren't that many. They're simply listed by the name of the bank. Not in alphabetical order, but it's easy enough to uh, get through the list. Seen here is Lincoln Bank, which doesn't reference Woolwich, but does include a name that is seen in other areas as a Woolwich resident. Pelic Tallman is the bank's president and director, and he's also listed under the Justices of the Peace and Quorum. For post offices and postmasters, the information includes distance and postage from Portland. I'm focusing more on the social history aspect of the main register, but I'm sure you all can see how it can be really useful for genealogy. The people named in these books is limited, but if your ancestor was politically, civically, or commercially involved in his or her community, you may find him here. And that's actually how I became interested in this uh, resource. Even if you don't find them, it's still a lot of great information that provides some context. These earlier editions in particular included a fair amount of military information. Here's one page of the pay and subsistence of the army. There were other pages, but I chose this one because I think it's interesting to see, for instance, the musician, the carriage maker, and the apothecary general. The columns indicate their pay per month, number of rations per day, and any remarks. Near the bottom, we can see that the military storekeeper's salary is not to say exceed the pay and evolution of a captain of infantry. And that is right here. Let's now skip ahead a few years to 1889-90. This table shows some of the censuses for each state and territory since the U.S. Census in 1790. There's a reason why some of the main register titles include such phrases as national calendar or U.S. calendar. These are definitely national in scope on many topics which gives us a good picture of the types of things that would have impacted the daily life of U.S. residents. For instance, along with lists of presidents, senators, and representatives, you'll also find a list of foreign ministers, and I think that's also their salary that's listed there. The average citizen wouldn't have crossed paths with these people, but their work would have influenced uh, international relations and how other nations viewed the U.S. They are some of the influencers. 
All right, I realize there's a lot on this screen. Um, there were several pages listing the state officers since formation of constitution. Governors, secretaries of state, attorney generals, land agent, ad adjutant generals, I always stumble on that word, uh, and many more. These are the policymakers of the time and other influential people whose decisions and actions impacted society. Custom rates provide further insight into society, not only for the fees, but also the descriptions. Some of them are quite specific, such as those for tobacco, which mention the number of horses, mules, or other animals when explaining the rates. And those who attended Nathan Lippert's talk on custom houses or watched the recording may have noticed that one of the sources he used when talking about custom houses was the main register. It contains a lot of information that uh, can help it even, even um, explore particular topics, buildings, so forth. Court districts are certainly useful to know. The register lists various positions and a description of locations covered by the district. The District of Bath includes the town of Dresden in the county of Lincoln, the county of Sagadhawk, except that part of Woolwich lying on the Sheepscot River, the counties of Kennebec and Somerset, and that part of the county of Androscoggin lying north and east of the Androscoggin River. Very specific. Meanwhile, the District of Wiscasset includes that part of the town of Woolwich lying on the Sheepscot River and all that part of the county of Lincoln lying west of the center of Danvergatta River except the town of Dresden. The mail is another very important aspect of daily life. Considering folks in this time only had snail mail, it was especially vital to know the cost for types of items and for various locations. There are several pages about postage rates and related information, including mail being sent to other countries, as you can see here. And I think there was even uh, another page about international uh, mail. State institutions, including some schools, are listed. And fortunately, the register doesn't list, you know, all the little towns across the state, but it's still useful for discovering some other types of schools. For instance, the main industrial school for girls in Hallowell, complete with the names of the trustees, executive committee, and officers of the school. And it's interesting, I never, I didn't realize we had such a thing. <laughs> so you end up stumbling across all these um, neat little gems that you maybe didn't realize existed. And I had to include this one, licensed state detectives. Uh, I just had to wonder if my ancestor ever considered hiring one to investigate his son's disappearance and possible murder. Uh, I don't know about that, but I'm sure you thought about it. Of course, the news is critical for staying informed, and at this time, newspapers were the main source for news, well, aside from gossip, of course. A few pages of the main register list the newspapers of the time. This page includes Sagadahawk County, and I'm sure we all recognize these titles. I especially appreciate that the register also indicates the publisher, the type of newspaper, and the publication days. Here we see examples of transportation and more forms of communication, telegraphs and telephones. There are several pages of details about these topics, including existing companies, distances, routes, fares, and the names of some of the people in the industry. By 1871, the main register was organized more by county and towns than by topic. You might see it described as town statistics. I'm not sure when this happened, but the most recent digital version available is 1856, and that one isn't yet organized by county. So something, somewhere between 1856 and 71, I guess. The town entry for Woolwich in 1889-90 is fairly short, but it does provide us with some details about settlement, the town's population over time, some of the town leaders, merchants, manufacturers, and associations. Earlier, we saw that Woolwich had a population of 1,050 in 1810. Decades later, the population hasn't really grown that much. Uh, in 1870, it was 1,168, and in 1880, 1,154. Now let's leap forward to 1966. 
Here's a sign of how times have changed. Educational TV, and there's even a committee for it. And there are several similar items listed. The types of associations and organizations have also changed and grown over the years. Some have existed for a long time. Others were founded more recently, relatively speaking. I had to look up the last two clubs mentioned on this page to find out what they were. I'd never heard of them before. According to the website for the organization, the Seroptimist was formed in 1921 in Oakland, California, at a time when women were not permitted to join service organizations. Our name, loosely translated from the Latin, means best for women. That's a quote. And they, quote, provide women and girls with access to the education and training they need to achieve economic empower empowerment, unquote. The Zonta Club was founded in 1919, and their focus is on women's rights, including, quote, equality, education, and an end to child marriage and gender-based violence, unquote. And just for the record, this isn't so much a promotion of either group. I simply wanted to learn what these unusual names were. And I figured some of you might also be curious. Um, so I had to share that. The main register continues to reflect the social, political, and legal landscape and changes over time. Here we have two amendments to the main constitution, forbidding discrimination against any person and eliminating voter restrictions on paupers. I don't think I even realized there were restrictions, but I guess we'll let you have it. And another one not pictured here was providing continuity of government in case of enemy attack which you would have thought they'd have had that all along, but you know. <laughs> There's a section listing gubernatorial votes over the years. And, and you'll find this in other years too, including much earlier ones. The interspersed throughout are these notes on significant events or changes. Honestly, it's actually a lot of fun just to go find and read all these little notes because it's so, there's so many different ones and they're all completely, um, so they're not random, but every single one touches on something different. So I have the red arrow, arrow pointing to one, a note explaining, at this time, a party styled the Know Nothing or American suddenly developed itself by secret organization and existed two years. And many of you will be familiar with the Know Nothings and their notorious attitudes and actions, including burning a local church, and then also up in Ellsworth, tarring and feathering some poor minister. Now bringing it back to our local community of Woolwich, the register lists all the towns and the number of votes for governor in 1862 and for president in 1864. Um, so actually, this is a good example, too, of the fact that even though the year is technically, you know, 19, did I say 1862 and four? Well, anyway, sorry, you probably know what I mean. 19, I got to get my head out of the 1800s. 1962 and 1964. Um, so even though the register itself is for the year 1966, you still find information from previous years. Woolwich had 304 votes for John H. Reed and 247 for Maynard Dolliff. In the presidential election, the town had 229 votes for Barry Goldwater, 493 for LBJ. And that seems like a pretty big difference there. Um, here we have another census valuation tax rates table. And more stuff is found here. Woolwich's population is less than it was several decades before. Now it's at 1,417. And their entry in these sections for the individual towns is a little longer than it was in 1889-90. This is part of it. The rest is on the next slide. We now see um, new additions in types of titles and, and so forth, for in instance, there's now a fish commissioner, truant officer, and a director of civil defense and safety, among other titles. The town also has more businesses, such as auto repair stations, electrical contractors, and a tree surgeon. That is such a main thing right there. There's also a description um, of Sagadahawk County, which I believe you'll find a description of each county um, before it gets into all its little towns. And uh, this one, it's the smallest in area in the state. Sagadahawk lies next east of Cumberland County on the southwest central coast. 
Farming, shipbuilding, commercial fisheries, commerce, and the vacation travel business are principal economic activities. And then down to physical features, rolling to hilly coastal terrain. Barry Meeting Bay, 10 miles from the sea, is confluence of Kennebec, Androscoggin, Cadence, Abigadasset, and Eastern Hivers. I've never even heard of that one. Outlet is lower channel of Kennebec Hiver to the sea, separating Georgetown and Pittsburgh peninsulas. And there is, there's much more that uh, I will let you read on, on your own time. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna to touch on this just briefly. So I've covered the three main years that I wanted to talk about. Now I have some just totally random things that uh, caught my fancy. These next two slides uh, are for a certain musical elf in the crowd. Regardless of your purpose for researching or your area of interest, there will be something in these books for you. As an example, someone who has spent their life in a musical career might appreciate learning about any musical aspects of life over time. On the left is an ad for E.F. Duran, bookseller and stationer, an agent for periodicals, who invites attention, he's so polite, invites attention to his large and valuable stock of school, classical, theological, medical, law, musical, juvenile, and miscellaneous books. He has something for everyone. On the right are excerpts from the sections of the register for products, in this case, for musical instruments. And if I'm understanding, the, understanding this correctly, there was an investment of $2,000. And then there were four men employed producing the instruments, which then had a value of just over $3,000. But be sure to also check the tariff of duties for music paper, musical instruments, and even for the strings of those musical instruments. Here are a few more musical goodies this time from 1852. You'll find musical associations. Um, by the way, I just have to point out the very appropriate name in the image on the left, E.H. Piper. Piper in a musical association. On the right, there are a variety of musical listings, including the Franklin County Musical Institute and the Cumberland, Cumberland County Philharmonic Society. Since I mentioned ads earlier, I wanted to include this fun find. I discovered this ad in the main register for the main register. <laughs> All libraries should have a full set for reference. This book gives a complete progressive history of all main interests. I guess they're allowed to be a little self-serving, right? <laughs> now that you know how much fun these books are, I know y'all are on the edges of your seats waiting to hear where you can find them. In the process of learning more about the main register, I started bookmarking all the digital versions I found. I realized it might be helpful to provide a list of them so you folks won't have to try to hunt them down. I, the handout I created ended up being seven pages long. I got curious, decided to count them. There were more than 60 different years available online. I think it's close to 65, maybe even slightly more. Clearly, there are much more available online than I realized. As you can see here, I was finding them at multiple websites, all the usual suspects of Google Books, Internet Archive, Family Search, and Hadith Trust, um, as well as the online books page. It's entirely possible there are even more that I somehow missed, but this is a great collection so far. I've also noted that these books can be downloaded by anyone from all these websites except Hadith Trust which requires a partner sign-in. This site is a group of universities and other partner institutions, and that's what I'm referring to here. Um, I've noted too that you do have to be signed in to FamilySearch before you can view and download, but it is free. Of course, these books are also available at many libraries, archives, and historical societies. We have quite a few at Patent Free Library, and I know Bowdoin College has a robust collection as well. I've created a PDF document of their catalog listing so you can see what they have that we don't and vice versa. Unfortunately, I don't think their library is open to the public right now, but at least you now know they're another great location for finding these books. And they were not in the special collections, or at least when I saw them, they were out in the stacks. Uh, and of course, Maine Historical also has several main registers, and I'm sure many, many other libraries and societies do as well. 
searching for these in catalogs can uh, sometimes be a bit of a pain, a little bit tricky. Um, mostly I just use the phrase in quotes, main register, but the results don't necessarily give you a neat list of all the main registers in a particular library. Part of the reason is um, because of the titles vary. I've included here a screenshot, well, along with a listing of the various titles, including um, like at the top, it doesn't even start with main register. It just says main state yearbook and legislative manual. So you kind of have to play around with it a bit. Um, and there's a screenshot here for part of a WorldCat listing for an item that makes note of this very issue under their notes section and the other titles section where it uh, references the fact that there are different uh, titles over the years. In our catalog, Minerva, it took some playing around to find listings for specific libraries. Subject headings are useful in these searches too. Um, Jill can probably give you some pointers on using the catalog efficiently when searching for these. Um, and after I end this, I think I'm gonna bump it to her and she's probably gonna show us, uh, we were talking earlier, so I think she's gonna show us a little bit of catalog searching. Here's a picture of our copies of the main register, along with the list of which years are in our holdings. I made the list based on what I saw on the shelves in this bookcase. These are in the tower because, as you can see, they require a lot of space. It's best to contact the history room ahead of time if you want to use these so Jill or another staff member can pull the appropriate years and have them available in the history room and ready for when you arrive for your appointment. Thankfully, you don't have to wait for an appointment to start exploring. As I mentioned, many digital versions can be viewed online and most of them can be downloaded. At Family Search, when you're in the, the screen seen here, signed in, of course, um, you'll click down where that red arrow is, click on View All Pages in the bottom left corner. That will take you to a viewer screen where you'll then click the download button, which is a tiny box with a tiny little downward arrow in it. It's difficult to see here, but I've highlighted it in the red square. Once you click on the download button, you'll then see the options shown on the right. You can select download PDF for the entire book, um, or you can download just one page if you prefer. Maybe there are only one or two things that you want to, to have or that you need for your research. At Google Books, when you click on the tool button, a drop down list appears. Just select PDF or download PDF. This doesn't actually start the download process, of course, it just opens it as a PDF, which then has the standard download option in the upper right corners that all PDFs have. In Internet, Internet Archive, it does the same thing. You'll see. Uh, when you're on the page looking at the book, below it, you scroll down and you'll see below it all these options. When you click on the download PDF option, it will open it up and then you can download it. And there are other formats that you can choose as well. And it's the same with the online books page. Uh, it references main legislature. Apparently that's really where it came from. But when I tried looking for a direct link, I wasn't having much luck. So I, it's, this is just the simplest way to get to them. And there are a few here that are not in those other locations. And same thing here, just click on the link to open the PDF and then you can download it. And one last thing, <laughs> I thought it might be fun to show changes at Patent Free Library over the years. These images are from the online versions. So not every year is available. Um, also, I only included here those years that reflect a change, a different staff or an increase in volumes or a decrease. When you go exploring on your own, you'll discover that the placement of the library information changes over time, as do a lot of things in these books. Initially, when the register is organized by topic only, Patent Free is listed in its appropriate section with all other libraries and similar organizations. Later, when the register separates out the towns, the library is listed in the bath section along with other bath related items. But even within that structure, the location of the library information changes. First, it's included in a section that lists associations and that's pretty much what you're seeing here, especially um, these here. Um, but later, there is a specific library heading 
just as there are headings for uh, associations, churches, dentists, and library stables. There are six or so slides <laughs> of these things, so I won't necessarily spend a lot of time on each one, um, but these slides will be available for you to view later. However, I do want to point out a couple of people. By 1882-83, George Newman is the librarian and treasurer, and we have um, 3,000 volumes right here. Then in 1891-92, we see a different librarian. And now the collection has uh, finally increased. Oh, right, because I forgot to mention, by 1889-90, not pictured here, it's still George, and there are still 3,000 volumes. So for several years, uh, George is in charge, and the collection doesn't grow at all. Um, but by 1891-92, uh, we have a new librarian, and now we have 4,000 volumes. There may be a reason that George never added to the collection. Um, I'm not sure what happened there. The other person I want to make a special mention of is Mrs. M. R. Foote. We first see her in 1889, uh, sorry, 1898-99. All these numbers tripping up my tongue. Um, at this time, the library has 8,500 volumes. Also, this image on the bottom right is where you can see that there's now a separate listing for libraries. It's no longer listed uh, in a big paragraph with a bunch of other associations. And in each one of these, it's still Mrs. M. R. Foote and it continues to grow. And on the bottom, not to be confused, there's also a Sagadahawk County Law Library and they have 4,500 volumes, while ours have now grown to 10,400 by 1902. Through each of these years, Miss M. R. Foote is still the librarian and the collection continues to grow each year. Notice as of 1904-05, there is a law library um, that was on the last slide, I think actually. And for a couple of years, the Tabard Inn is listed as having a library. And still this foot and still a growing collection. Now let's fast forward to 1934-35. She's finally referred to by her first name, Margaret, and the collection has grown from the 8,500 volumes from 1898 to 99. Now it's up to 29,507 volumes. That's a pretty decent growth under her watch. I've got a gap in years, but the next time a digital edition is available is five years later in 1940-41. Now the librarian is Mrs. Bertha C. Dean, and the collection is up to 37,431 volumes. Bertha continues to add to the collection, but then we have another gap in available years online. Several years later in 1955-56, the collection is back down to the same as it was 20 years earlier. I'm curious what happened there. <laughs> really aggressive weeding maybe? I don't know what happened, but thankfully the numbers increased after that. And here are some more recent collection numbers since we're on the topic. <laughs> As of just a few years ago, our collection had over 64,000 items. I'm pretty sure that does not include the 10,000 ebooks and 4,800 audiobooks in the cloud library. We also have over 62 databases, plus thousands of unique items in the history room. And by the way, those databases within themselves also contain thousands and thousands of items and collections. I hope this has provided you all with a better understanding of this fabulous resource. As can be seen, the register can be used for many research purposes and topics. Whether you're an author, historian, student, genealogist, or any other kind of researcher, whatever your topic, it's helpful to know and understand the various aspects of life in whatever time period you're studying. How did people communicate? What were the industries? How did people travel? Who were the influencers? Where might people have gathered and for what purposes? Religion, fraternal, and so on? what educational opportunities were available. I, by the way, I did not even get into showing you how fun it was to read about Bowdoin College back in the day and the kinds of descriptions and details they included for, for that college. Um, what were the uh, political, social, legal, financial, and medical landscapes like? Consider these questions as you peruse the main register. As I've indicated on this slide, to learn more about these and other resources, you can contact the History Room using a variety of means. 
and I do want to reiterate for, for these particular things, you really do want to make sure to um, inform us ahead of time so that we can have them ready for you. And uh, I've referenced a few of these things throughout. But thank you for joining us. And I am going to end this slideshow. Stop my screen sharing. All righty. And um, Jill, did you want to go through the catalog or are we good? Um, Before we get to the questions. Yeah. Yeah, I could do a brief, a very brief little tutorial if anybody would like to see it. Linda's nodding. I see a nod. <laughs> okay. That's good enough for me. Um, I will share my screen. Okay, so can you see my browser window? Yes. Great. Is that all you can see or is there a bunch of junk behind it? I might just see it. Okay, cool. That's how I want it to be. So you can see that I am on the um, Minerva homepage uh, for patent-free library. If you are at another Minerva library or you just want to see what all Minerva locations have, you can select all Minerva locations when you search. And um, I'll just show you what a keyword search for main register looks like. You're going to find quite a few things and you will have to read each of them to know if it's the one you're looking for. You can also do a title search for main register. I just changed from keyword to title here in this drop down menu. And here's something called the main register. Let's take a look at that. The one we're looking for is the main register state yearbook and legislative manual. And similar titles. <laughs> Unfortunately, it just changed so much. There were so many different titles. <laughs> oh yeah. So I can I can tell you all a little bit about why <laughs> that makes it difficult to find um, every volume in a catalog. Um, so without going too far into it, um, cataloging serial publications like this one can be a little bit difficult. Um, there have been different conventions over the years for how that's done. Um, so sometimes you'll find one catalog record for each time a publication changes name. Um, other times there will be just one catalog record for the entire history of the publication, whether it changed names or not. Um, and then occasionally you'll find one catalog record for each volume um, or each publication year. This, the new standard um, or the most recent way of doing it is to create a new catalog record every time a publication changes name. Um, and so I can show you an example of where that works well. Uh, there's a, yeah, so there's a publication, a magazine called Steamboat Bill of Facts that was published under that name until 1958. And then it changed its name to Steamboat Bill. So this is the catalog record for Steamboat Bill of Facts. And if you scroll down, you can see that the publication is continued by Steamboat Bill. And you can actually just click on this and it will take you to the catalog record for Steamboat Bill, which um, published under that name for a time until it became what it is known as today, which is Power Ships. So again, you can scroll down to the bottom and you see that um, Steamboat Bill is continued by Power Ships. Uh, there's also a link to go back to Steamboat Bill of Facts. And so that is like the ideal way to catalog a <laughs> a publication that changes names over time. And this is the nerdy cataloger in me speaking right now. So I'm going to cut myself off. I'll go back to the record for the main register. And I'm going to scroll down and show you where it doesn't work so well. Um, we have 
again, it continues in a continued by field, which suggests to you some of the other names that this went by. But if you click them, they don't take you to, a, they don't always take you to a specific record. So this one takes you to a record that just has one entry in it. It's not very helpful. Um, and the year one, I've noticed is not necessarily always included um, in the titles. I think that's a problem I ran into as well. So or maybe I'm confused. <laughs> yeah, so in an ideal world, the, the year isn't going to be in the title of the catalog record because the catalog record is a record for um, all of the issues of the periodical or so okay. all of the volumes each year. And so what you have here is main register, state yearbook and legislative manual. And usually what you'll see is each library has its own little table, which shows you which years that library has. And it may not be years, like for this publication, it was published annually, but sometimes publications are done quarterly or monthly. And so the format of these dates might change, but this is what you're looking for when you wanna know what patent-free library has. And there's a disclaimer here. I think we have earlier than 1872. Maybe Karen, you know. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay, so I need to. We have at least it. two that are earlier than that, I think. Okay, cool. So sometimes the catalog doesn't actually tell you the whole story. Um, so that's something that I'm planning to do uh, maybe Monday. <laughs> I'll add all of the ones that we do have. And that was actually why um, instead of using this list, because I had the one screen that had the list of all the years that we have and um that's actually why because i was getting a little confused and then i think maybe the years are written a little different here than what i was seeing on the spine so i decided i'm just going to write exactly what i see on the shelves in the tower and write it the way the spines are labeled um and so there's an entire list on one of those slides and that combined with what's in the catalog people should be able to see pretty well what we've got yeah, I think I'll work from your list when I go to correct this because it's, something is obviously wrong. So this is less a tutorial and more of a, <laughs> uh, this type of thing is difficult, don't get discouraged. Even the cataloger gets discouraged and confused sometimes. Um, so before I stop sharing my screen, I just want to point out that these are the other Minerva libraries and they each have a different, you know, way of expressing and a different number of volumes available. So if you're closer to MacArthur Public Library in Biddeford or Maine Historical Society in Portland or Jessup in Bar Harbor, then you can find those, you know, if they're open. Um, so that is all I will tell you about that. Um, yeah, and actually I will add to that most of the time these are going to be non-circulating I don't know if there are any libraries that have them circulating at all, but you know, that's why you also are gonna want to probably either, if you need to make an appointment, do so, um, but just know that you're not likely to be able to take them out. Although if you're lucky like me, um, some topping things, you might be able to get your hands on your very own. I've got six of these, and thankfully most of them are years that are not available digitally. So I have a few years that I can fill in. That was 1914. I don't think I have any from the 1800s, but still, it's it's um it's pretty fun, and it's you can see it's this particular one is not that big. <laughs> a couple of them are a little bigger. Uh, let's see. I can't even read what year this is. I think 1943-44, and this one a little bit bigger, <laughs> but they're still really hefty. Um, yeah, so, alrighty, and that's all I had. Jill, did you have anything else you wanted to share before we end the recording? Nope, let's open it up to questions. Thank you, Karen. Alrighty. Great, thank you.